Amen. Well, turn with me this morning to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, and we're starting a series on the early life of Moses. And so we're going to start here at the very beginning with kind of a a little bit longer text than normal, but it tells a story that, that we need to kind of get a feel for the whole thing to really kind of understand what we're talking about this morning. And so here we are in Exodus chapter 1, and we're going to verse 8, and it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shepra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king commanded them. But they let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took, him for a, uh, took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bedouin and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her, while her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away. And nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Let's pray. Father, we take on today a familiar story, but one that speaks to us in these times that we live in. Help us, God, to see how this speaks to us. And help us apply this in a way that's going to make a difference in our lives. And we'll thank you for this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, as I was reading this, I I thought of what's a painful story in my life. And it goes back to the first time that that I met Lois. Uh, She had come down when I was living in West Palm Beach. and, And some of her family was going to my dad's church. And she'd come down from Indiana and she was with her, some of her family, and she's there visiting them, and they had this, like, dinner thing that I was at, Lois was at, and her and I just, we started talking a little bit, and when dinner was done, I thought things were going good, and so I popped this question, hey, would you, would you like to go out and maybe see some of the area? I thought it was pretty good, and you know what she said? No. No. What a terrible answer. What a, what a painful answer. 
Now, her answer, the reason she says to this day was that she was getting ready to leave early the next morning and she had to get packed and had things to do. But it would be three more years till I'd ever see her again and, and have another chance. And uh, I learned something that day that I already knew, but it was, a, it was a powerful reminder, and that is that there is such a thing as inconvenient timing. She'd been there the entire week, and it wasn't until her last day that, that I got to be around her. And I'm talking today about inconvenient timing because inconvenient timing is a part of our lives, isn't it? You know, I've got, I can tell you between the church and my house, there are 10 traffic lights. 10. I've counted them, and I've counted them. Wednesday, I had to drive back and forth between the church three times. So I had 60 traffic lights I had to, to go through over and over again, and I counted them. And what drives me crazy, I can't figure it out. Sometimes when I'm coming, I'll get nine of those lights red. I can't think of a time that I got nine of them green, but I've got nine of them red quite often. And it's difficult because I don't like that timing. I want to go when it's all green lights. I want to go to McDonald's when I drive up to the drive through window. I don't have to invest the rest of my afternoon waiting on that bag of food to come. I want it right then. We all want those things, right? That's our rights as Americans to not wait any longer than we have to at the McDonald's drive through window. Right? We know this. And so we like convenient timing, but unfortunately we live in a world of inconvenient timing. And this takes us to this series. And it takes us to this story that's taken us a little while to read through because it talks about an inconvenient time in the nation of Israel. And it follows what really was a good time in the nation of Israel. We, we're probably familiar with the, the end of Genesis and the story of Joseph, how God raised him to be second in command of Egypt and, and saved that nation from a great famine. And, and as a reward, Joseph was able to bring his family in from Israel and they moved in so Joseph could take care of them, make sure they were well fed. And, and so Genesis ends on kind of this up happy note for the nation of Israel and really just kind of a little tribe group at that point. And, and they all move there. Everything's good and wonderful. But now we get into Exodus. And we might think Genesis to Exodus, we may say, well, how long a time could this have been? What could be the gap between these two? I'll answer that question for you. 430 years. That's a long time, isn't it? 430 years, that's twice, better, almost twice the amount of time that we've been a nation. And so here we are, 430 years later, and a lot of things have changed. Joseph's contribution has been forgotten. The Israeli people, that wasn't all that many at the end of Genesis, has multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied, and suddenly the Egyptians have kind of woke up and have realized that there is a group of foreigners who are in their nation that have grown astronomically, and they are a huge slice of the population, and they think, what happens if we get invaded? What happens if, if these Jews, somebody comes to them and says, we're getting ready to invade Egypt. If you'll rise up and, and go with us, we'll allow you to have the northern half of the nation or we'll give you this or give you that. And, and they agree. And so the, the Egyptians become terrified of them. And they realize we've got to, we've got to do something about this. We've got, to, we've got to pare this down. And so here is, in the Bible, our first use of this idea of genocide. They're going to start wiping out some of this Jewish population. They're going, to, they're going to start just kind of getting rid of all the male Hebrews that are going to be born. They're going to just kill them. They're going to throw them into the Nile. And so Pharaoh ends up through this process, he ends up getting everybody in the nation to agree that if they see a baby Hebrew boy, that they're just going to take him over to the river, throw him in, he's going to drown, or a crocodile is going to eat him. It's going to be the end of him. And they're going to be able to control the population by doing this. And so we, we see that these are terrible times. And it's, it's a horrible time to, to be a Hebrew. And on top of this, they're slaves there in the land of Egypt. And so life's very oppressive for them. And it's, it's become very difficult, very nasty. And, and, and we're told here at the start of Exodus 2 that it's at this point that a young couple gets married. 
And it's at this point that this young couple ends up discovering a baby is on the way. And don't you know, it's going to be a boy that's going to be born. And that should be a time of joy. It should be a time of excitement. It should be great happiness for the family. But instead, it's a terrible, terrible time. It's a, it's a time that, that this little baby that's meant to bring a family joy ends up just bringing this death sentence into their home. And, and, and so here they are. And, you know, we, we don't have a record of what the parents said about that. But let's just, let's just figure they're like all the rest of us, right? I mean, the Bible, as we read this, it, it, it's meant to kind of let us know these aren't super saints, the people that are in the Bible. These are humans that are in the Bible interacting with God. And we learn about God and we learn about our humanity as, as, as we get into the Word of God. And so let's just know what they're probably saying. They're probably saying something along the line, why is God doing this? They're probably saying something along the line, this isn't fair. Why is it so terrible? Why is it so bad? And, and this brings to us the first thing we've got to realize about inconvenient timing. If It's going to happen. There's going to be things that's going to happen to us that we're not going to like. And it is very easy as we deal with this to allow a cloud to enter into our homes, into our lives, into our minds, and into our spirit. And when that cloud arrives, if we allow it to stay, it will grow darker in our lives. And it will be easier to become more and more negative. And it is very possible that if we allow this thing to get so dark, what we end up doing is shutting the presence and the work of God out of our lives. Now, we don't have to be all Pollyanna about, oh, it's all going to be great. It's all going to be wonderful. Yeah, they're grabbing the Hebrew babies and they're throwing them into the river, but not our baby. I'm going to take them out and nobody will be able to touch them. That would be a dumb strategy, right? And it wouldn't be realistic. There, there's a challenge that's here. There's, there's difficulty that's here. And so these people are really facing something that's difficult to navigate. And so they have every right and every reason to be concerned. But if you are going to fight the battle of inconvenient timing, and you're going to come through it as a child of God, you're going to have to realize your attitude is going to be very important. And there's some things... That while you may not be all this, it's like a trip to Disney World, oh, it's so happy and so wonderful. That, while that may not be realistic, there's some other things, though, that's equally wrong. For example, if you want to start shaking your fist at God and turn him into your enemy, you know, you have the freedom to do that. We are not robots that God has programmed to respond in a way, and we have the freedom to shake our fist at God and to be mad at him. But why? What other help do you have? What other resources out there? What, what if, if you want to alienate God from you and push him away and be on your own, why do you do that? That's not a smart choice. I mean, the only hope is God alone. And so let's begin to realize that there are things that we can say that instead of receiving the help of God, we may be driving the help of God away from us. Another thing we should probably stop saying is this idea of, this just isn't fair. It's not fair. Somebody the other day, I was at a convenience store, and somebody bought a lottery ticket, and they didn't win, and they go, it's not fair. Well, you know, the lottery, I don't know if y'all know this, but the reason Florida does the lottery is not to make you rich. Did you know that? It, it's to make them rich. And, and so there's, for every winner, there's a lot of losers. And in the eyes of the state of Florida, that's fair. They like it. And, and sometimes we get this mentality, is everything, nothing's ever fair. I never caught me a break. You know what? I don't see anywhere that it's in the Bible that says life's going to be fair for you. I see a lot of people who felt life wasn't fair, but really they just didn't know what was going on. You know, these parents had every right to say this isn't fair. 
that our baby is being born in a time of genocide when lives are being wiped out and we're being held in slavery. This isn't fair. But what they may have missed is, is that at this point in time and this baby that was being born to them and they may be there crying out, this isn't fair. This was actually going to be a baby that God was going to use to change that situation. He was going to bring freedom to the nation. And it reminds us that, that what may seem a certain way to us Maybe something very different to God. We are unable to see the big picture. And maybe instead of starting to say all the time, oh, this just isn't fair, this isn't fair, oh, my life's so unfair. One, we just get tired of hearing other people say that. Because we want to be saying it. We don't want to hear you say that. Right? We, we just get tired. It's nothing, not, nobody can do anything about it. Maybe we should start saying, because nobody's ever, nothing's ever changed because somebody said this isn't fair. Maybe we should start saying, you know, here's another of those times I can't see the big picture of what God's up to, but I'm going to have to trust him. That's going to get you further anyway. Might as well trust, might as well say something that gets you somewhere. And see, this whole time what, we, what we're doing is we're getting this place where we realize that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth is going to speak. Now, there used to be this big teaching back in the 80s and this, this, uh, in, in 90s, this positive confession thing, you know. And, and, and I always thought it was, I, I really felt it was kind of dumb. And because the people that got into this positive, what we called positive confession, they got, so, they got so over the top with it, you couldn't even be honest around them. And it was almost like, you know, when, when, when the blind Bartimaeus comes to Jesus and, and he says, you know, uh, Jesus says, what do you want? Well, he's obviously blind. And he says to Jesus, I'm blind, right? Positive confession people would look at Bartimaeus and say, well, you are now. You just confessed it. He was blind. Somebody says, I had a cold. I remember one time positive confession person was around. I made the mistake of saying, I've got a cold. And, and they said to me, Oh, you just confessed that you do have. Well, I was sneezing and, and coughing before I met you and told you I had a cold. I had a cold. I didn't confess it into existence. Somebody gave me a germ, right? And it just got, it just got stupid. But you know, there was some truth that this thing was built on. Because out of the abundance of our heart, a mouth is going to speak. And sometimes our mouth gets running so much and gets so negative that we are creating that darkness. And so inconvenient timing is something that's going to find all of us. It is going to be a part of our lives. But what we've got power over is how much darkness we are going to allow to hold us at that place. At that time. Because negativity will lock us into something that will keep us from moving ahead and receiving the best of God. And so we've got to start by realizing, I've got to, I've got to get the right attitude in the midst of this inconvenient timing to make sure I'm not being held back. And this leads me to my next thing, because these parents, here they are, they get over this, and they, they come up with the plan. We're, going to just, we're just going to hide them. And so for three months, they get by with this. They're hiding them. And, and, you know, a baby, I don't know how you hide a baby for three months because my kids were born loud from the moment they came out of their mother's womb. But apparently, Moses was one of those who grew his lungs over time. And he got to a place, so he started getting too loud. And so this launches the basket plan. They get this basket, they make it out of bulrushes, they get it to where it's going to float, and they set it in the Nile River in the bulrushes. Now, this is in itself a little bit of a risky thing because there are crocodiles in the Nile River, and it's, it's, it's kind of a dangerous choice. But in the bulrushes, maybe they could tell, the, the, detect the movement of any crocodiles, and they, they get Moses' sister, and they have her kind of stand at the side to watch what's going on, and, and, and they are convinced that they are going to fight against this decree. And, and basically what they are doing is making a decision they got to fight. And, and I'm saying to us as Christians here today, we got to get our attitudes right, but we also need to know this. When we are up against inconvenience and it is oppressing us and it is weighing us down and keeping us from what God has for us, we need to know this. We're going to have to fight. we got to be people ready to fight. Now, that doesn't mean, please get me on this, it doesn't mean run out and buy a gun so you can shoot somebody. Do we understand? When I say fight, I'm not talking about harming another person. 
I really don't want to have to go visit you in jail because you did something stupid. So please understand what I'm saying here. I'm not talking about physical harm. The, the Bible talks about this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, where it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What's that saying? It's saying if somebody may be bothering you, you go get a gun and you shoot them, your problems have just started. You've got more problems than just the person being against you. You're, you're going to be going to court. You're going to be having to hire attorneys. You're going to probably be going to jail. You've got all these things. So, so when we're talking about fighting as believers, and this is always the thing that gets me. People are against the church. They'll, they'll, they'll hear some church talk about, you know, we're going to fight or we're going to stand up and we're, we're ready for warfare. And they think that means that, that we're like suddenly become a, a militia or something. If, if y'all hear, if you think you ever hear me calling for us to become a militia, you, let me just set it straight right now. You didn't hear me right. That's, that's, this world doesn't need more militias. This world needs some people that start praying and trusting God. This, this world needs people that in, instead of figuring out how to, to, to do hand-to-hand -hand combat, they figure out how they can start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, this, this, this world needs people who can understand how you start getting wisdom from God and applying it to your life. And so when I'm talking about fighting, I'm just talking about the idea that, that we got to stand up and do something under the direction of God. I hear people all the time saying, where's God in this? I think the question is, where are you in this? Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to let God direct you to do something? I, I had to realize as, as a dad when my kids came that I'm going to have to fight a battle for my kids. I saw all the time there were these people, and, and, and our world's full of them now, that they want to be the cool parent and have their kids like them a lot. I tell you what I believe that is. That's another way of saying I'm giving my kids over to the devil. I'm giving my kids to the world. I wasn't going to give my kids to the world. I came to this place, I, I realized I had to fight for them. And so I started doing things that it, maybe some people, I had a couple of people tell me, it's a little extreme, it's a little much. Well, you know what? I, I don't apologize. I... Uh, I had this thing, I'd, I'd heard too many stories of kids that went to lock-ins at people's homes, and when the parents went to bed around 1 or 2 in the morning, the kids started getting into pornography, or they started getting into some liquor or whatever, and, and these bad things happened. And so I started telling the kids, well, you know what, let's take you over to the sleepover, and I'll come get you at 1. But I wasn't going to let them stay there when they weren't going to be supervised. I've heard too many stories. I know what that was. That's on me for allowing that to happen. And so I, I protected my kids. I, I don't believe any kid that's under 14 or 15 years old should be watching an R-rated movie. I, don't, I, I think it's shame on you if they put on television TVMA for mature audiences and you're letting your 10-year-old 10, 10 sit there and watch that garbage. You give away the innocence of your child that can never be regained. That's lost forever. And so I was very careful about what my kids watched. I protected them with everything that I had. I, I kept them away. If I knew somebody was racist or talked dirty or said bad things about women, I'd just avoid I'd cover my kids' ears up and I'd run them out of there as quick as I could. I avoided I didn't care if I was related to them. I didn't care if they were good friends. I avoided those people. I didn't want my kids thinking that's the way people live. I, I had something better from the kingdom of God I wanted to introduce to them. I wanted to, to grow into their lives. Friends would come over to the house. We always had that house all the kids were playing in, and, and, and they'd come over. It was understood. They were always welcome there. We were glad to have them, but nobody's going to go in their room and close the door. Door had to stay open because things, if, 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 if there's little kids that's eight and nine years old and that door's got to be closed, it's not because you're going to be in there ruining their good time. It's going to be because they're trying to sneak something. And let me guarantee you this. That fallen Adam nature is in your children whether you realize it or not. And that sneaky will come out if you're not careful. You've got to watch out for it. 
we had this role, and you know, it was a few years before uh, a cell phones, smartphones were out, and so, but we had a role that if, if you're going to be looking at something on the internet, you had to be out in the room where all of us were. And, and I think today, I'd, I'd have to think about this, but I, I think today, if, if my kids were in this day where everybody has smartphones with connection to the internet, I think at bedtime I would take their phone and tell them they could have it in the morning. I don't think I'd let them go to bed and lay there in a place that they can't be seen looking at God knows what. Because there's people that are out there trolling for kids on the internet and they're there are things, it is easy to drift from what you went to look for into something that you shouldn't be looking at. And so I would, I would keep that still. But you know, even at that, there were times that, that my kids, they would, they would be going through some hard times. And the enemy would, would be coming and, and just kind of knocking on our door and, and, and pushing for my kids. And, and, and I would go out, the kids would go to bed, and I'd just get in the hall, and I'd just walk the hall. And I just start saying, Lord, that child, Laurel, belongs to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Grayson belongs to you in the name of Jesus Christ. You've given me this kid to raise for your glory and for your purpose. The devil can't have them. Devil, you leave them alone in the name of Jesus. They are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They have been protected. They have been set apart. They are going to be holy. They are going to serve you. They're going to follow you. And i got to tell you, I saw my kids struggle sometimes. We, in life, we have hard times. we got to make decisions. And, and, and I saw them struggle, but I'm proud to say, for everything I saw, they made good decisions. And, and I'm proud of them for that. Now, I can't promise you that every kid out there is going to do well because their parents fought for them. I've seen some parents fight, and some kids have still made some terrible choices. But one thing I can promise you is that if the devil shows up in my home he better know he's not getting out of there without a couple black eyes, a few less teeth, and me biting his ear off the side of his head. He's going to have to fight me because I'm not giving my kids to the devil. And if we're at a place that we're just this kind of whatever mentality with our children or with our grandchildren, shame on us. Who can fight for people that don't even know what the battle's about? Who's going to be able, what kid can stand up? They don't know the devil's tricks and, and, and wiles, but we do. We've got to do this. And I could go on and on of other situations that we've got to be ready to fight for in life, not just with our children, but there are steps of righteousness that we as the people of God have got to know that it's worth the battle. Now, I do want to add this with the kids. The kids grow older. And there comes time you've got to start giving them some freedom. And in those times, I ended up having to start fighting myself. I wanted to keep Grayson and Laurel at like six and eight years old. That would have been so much. Those of your parents, y'all understand what I'm saying? So much easier. So much easier. But that 13's are coming really fast. I don't know what it is about ninth grade for most kids. But ninth grades are coming, and it is a day of some difficult choices that kids have got to make. If your kids are going in eighth or ninth grade, you better, they're, they're getting ready to go into a pressure cooker of the devil. You better be ready to start praying and get some family members and friends praying for your kids. And you better make Pastor Chris your best friend in the entire world. Because it's a, it's a battle you're going to have to fight, but we do this. We start to give some freedom as they prove they can take it. I used to tell them, I used to get mad at me. I just felt like there's nothing good's going to happen on a date with two young people that don't even have a driver's license yet. And, and I told them, I said, you know, I said, if y'all want to go on a date, you can go out with friends. If you're going to go, once you get your driver's license, you're going to go on a date. You're going to have until 10 o'clock, and you've got a double date until you're out of high school. And so we're a senior in high school. I... I I was tough on them sometimes. But let me tell, tell me what was wrong with that. What's, what, I, I can tell you what's wrong with the opposite of, of no safeguards or protection. But what's wrong with standing up for your kids and sometimes them being mad at you? And it turned out I was the only person in their school doing that because they said all the other kids 
didn't have to do that. They were the only ones, apparently, that, that had that happen. And I didn't believe that. But if that's true, you better really be fighting for your kids because there's a lot of hellions being raised in a lot of homes around your kids. All the more reason you want to protect them. This takes us on to the next thing. And it comes down to what happens after they start fighting this battle and, and, and what ends up taking place. And I, kinda, I, I love this part of the story because what, what ends up happening is the unexpected of God. And, and this is what I believe. If we're willing to trust God and, and make sure that our heart, while we may have our reservations, we still believe God can do something and we're willing to stand and fight, I believe we can expect God to do some good things. I'm a big believer in the surprises of God. And boy, what surprises this family ends up with. This is just crazy stuff starts to happen. You know, here's this little baby. You think it doesn't get any more hopeless. They're probably worried. I sure hope this, this tar we put in here is going to hold and that this basket isn't going to sink. And I hope, you know, they got all these worries. I hope a crocodile doesn't come and they got all this stuff. But, but in the midst of, you know, we always have this what if game we play that we're imagining the worst what ifs, right? What if, what if, you know, some, some big catfish eats the kid? What if, you know, this happens or that happens? You couldn't imagine what was going to happen next. Here comes Pharaoh's daughter down to the river with the, her whole entourage. And she's coming along and she's going to be bathing. And who discovers the hidden basket but her? Oh, no, her dad's the one that's made this order that these babies have got to be thrown in. This whole nation of Egyptians, they're at the place they're hating these Jews. They're more than ready to throw these kids in. And, and here's the princess, great, this is... This is over. What are we, what are we going to do? Well, it turns out we're not positive 100% of who she may have been and the exact timing on this, but we think that, that she may have been this princess known as Hapshat Sut. And so maybe some of you have heard her name before, maybe not. But she has this historic reputation for telling her dad how it was going to be. And he may have said, throw the kid in the river, but she would be the one. She ends up ruling Egypt for a while, but she ends up kind of being a hard-as-nails kind of person that would do exactly what she'd want to do, and she had a dad that would let her do it. And so of all the people to find this baby here in these bulrushes and decide that she is going to keep him and decide that she is going to raise him in the palace and he is going to receive the best education, how does that happen? I mean, think about this. From a death sentence a certain death sentence for this baby to a life of luxury that's going to be unbelievable and training and education that anybody would have done anything for. How do you go from this to this? My answer is only by God. No amount of scheming would ever put you in this place. No, no amount of dreaming could ever get you into that place. Those parents could have made a list and could have said, what do we want the best thing for our baby? Okay, let's fold it up and let's believe that's what's going to happen. That list isn't going to get you in that place. God alone gets you in that place. And then I kind of like the next part of the story because this sister of Moses is we, we don't get a lot of stories about Miriam in the Bible, but I'd like more because she's, pretty, she's a pretty sly kid. She sees what's going on. She can't run down and say, that kid's my baby brother. Give him to me. That's not going to work. So what does she do? She acts like, oh, I'm just going to go down and see what I can do to work this out. And so she sees the princess with it. Oh, you found a baby, she says. Isn't that something? And she says, you, you probably want to keep him, kind of, you know, stuff I imagine she's saying. And, and she says, you know, I even know, a, I know a, a, a Hebrew mother that's nursing right now. She could probably nurse that baby for you. And the princess said, go get her. And so who does she go and get? She goes and gets her mom, Moses' mom. And so Moses' mom comes down, not saying that's my baby, but the princess says, will you take him and wean him for me? And here's the best part, I will pay you for it. If you have kids, you understand what I'm going to say. You pay to have kids. 
It's expensive. We do it because we love the need to have them. You get paid. Once again, only God. Only God. Only God does these kind of surprises. Only God does these kind of things. And what I want us to get in our spirit is this, this idea that when we are at these places, when things don't seem to be working out in our lives, when the timing seems to be wrong and it seems everything's against us, don't forget what God can do for you. Don't forget who you serve, who you belong to. Don't allow your mind to immediately go to that negativity where you're always, it's just not, nothing's going to happen, I never get a break. I, you know what, if you're not a Christian, maybe you do never get a break. But if you're a Christian, God's found you, he's saved you, he's turned your life around, and all things are possible. And so we just begin to believe this, and we begin to trust God, and we allow him to, to bring us surprises. I, I remember when I was going to Southeastern, I was graduated as the mid 80s and there was kind of a recession on and so it just was a lot of churches were kind of holding back and 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 hiring uh staff people and and i was trying so hard to find a position and i don't even remember how many resumes i had out but every day i'd go stand at the phone booth there on campus this was before cell phones some of y'all maybe didn't know there was a time like this but we actually had these boxes they were like this big, and they smelled like somebody would used the bathroom in them a lot of times, probably because they did. And you'd stand there, and you'd talk on this phone, and, and you'd put coins in and all this. And so you, you'd go through all this, and, and I'd called people and called people, and nothing was happening. And it was two weeks before I graduated, and I am, I got to tell you, I was at my lowest point. And it was just, I'd given up. Lord, I, I, I listened to you tried to follow you. I've got all these resumes out. I'm calling these people. People won't even take my calls. People won't listen to me. They'll just, they'll get rid of me as soon as they accidentally would answer when I called. And I was so discouraged and, and, and I was ready to give up. And I was thinking, did I make a mistake feeling I belonged in ministry? Is this, is this, you know, is this has been going on for months? And, and here I am two weeks away and I go and I open up my mailbox and there's a note from the president of the college in there and it said, come see me. And I thought, oh, Lord, what have I done? What is it? So I go over and see him, and it turns out one of his best friends has a church in Meridian, Mississippi. And he was looking for a youth pastor, and he said, I told him all about you. I hope you haven't found a place yet because this is an incredible opportunity. And it was. It was incredible. And it was a God surprise because I got to tell you, if I made my bucket list of ministry and what I wanted to do, I, I, if anybody's from Mississippi, I'm not insulting your state. I'm from West Virginia. I can't say a lot. So just, just get that. But I got to tell you, my dream job wouldn't have been in Mississippi. Wouldn't have been where I think it, but I loved it there. The wonderful people, nice. It was a God surprise. And, and I'm just saying, don't ever count out the surprises of God. Know what God can do. Know that regardless of the time, that Romans 8, 37 through 39 applies to us where it says, No, and all these things were more than conquered through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor bad timing nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's that saying? It's just saying despite what Things may seem like, despite the timing that may seem so wrong, God still loves you, and he's still at work in your life. Don't count out the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me across this building? And as you're bowing your heads, I just want you to start searching your heart right now, and I wanna, want you to ask yourself, where am I with God? Where am I? Have I made a decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, I know there's some of us that say, well, I'm in church. Of course, I've made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Or maybe some of us on live stream, you're saying, well, I'm watching the live stream. Of course, I've made a decision. No, that's, that's, that's good that you're doing this. Good that you're here. Good, good that you're watching. But that's where I need to be with the Lord. I am not, I am not the person that, that I am supposed to be. I want to I start a new life for Jesus Christ. I'm looking up in the balcony right now for anybody that's lifting their hand. Nobody else is looking around. Anybody on the floor is lifting their hand. Maybe you at home. I was just talking to somebody this week that made a decision as they were watching the live stream that they were going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And they, they, they started a new life in Christ right in their home, right in their kitchen. 
this morning, God has a new start and a new beginning, regardless of what your past has been. I want us all to say this prayer together. Repeat after me. And let's just believe that God's going to move and work in your life in a great way as you pray it. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, I've made mistakes. I've done wrong. Forgive me for every one of them. I'm turning away from my old life, and I'm going to start living for you. Thank you for this new start. In your name, Jesus, amen. We have some pastors that I have come up front here to pray, and I'm just going to ask them if they'll come up here this morning. I think we may have several of them that are just kind of out of the house here today. Rose, can I get you to come up here and help us pray for people this morning? Yeah, if you can help us out this morning. We've got them up here. Can I get Daryl and Dee, can I get you guys to come up and just stand up here this morning? I'm going to take a few moments. You know, I've always said one of the great things about Assembly of God Church is you can know no matter how beat up and, and tough your life may be when you come in, you can be prayed for by somebody who believes that God's got something better for you. And so this morning, maybe you're going through inconvenient timing in your health or your finances or in your home or, or, or whatever it may be, and you need a miracle. These people are up here this morning to pray with you for that miracle. If you made a decision today to become a follower of Jesus Christ, come up and have them pray for you. We'll give you a Bible. We've got some up here we'd like you to have to take home to, to get your start and your new beginning. But they are here this morning. So if you'll come, they'll pray, and we're going to believe God's going to make a difference. Will you stand? Let's worship. And if you need prayer for anything this morning, we're going to believe God's going to do something good for you.